bluegrass. It don't have to be country. It don't. It can be any type music, like beating drums mm -hmm. that the Indians done, and blah. Rhythm is what we're talking about. We're talking about the most important part of a man or a woman is rhythmically out of their heartbeat. So when you're playing music, when you get off beat, okay, most people play by uh, a bass fiddle, mm -hmm. and that bass fiddle is rhythmically. It can go up or it can go down. Mm -hmm. And it's up to the individual and his feelings about what he's doing to get the rhythm. Mm -hmm. If he gets off, he can screw the whole band up. If the guy on drums gets off, he can screw it all up. You can, in your own self, make your own rhythm with somebody else out of rhythm. Are you following me? Mm -hmm. Not everybody's heart is different. Everybody's heart has one rhythmatically set up. 60 beats per so minute. So we all come back to the same type of rhythm. Uh, it had nothing to do with race or anything of that nature. What we're really getting involved with is music is a talent. Hilo Brown was no different than uh, uh, Jim... Uh, I'm trying to think of the guy that made Dog and Gun. Bradley Kincaid. Bradley Kincaid. Bradley Kincaid had no more rhythmatic than you do. But what he did, he made this song that made sense. And it was about a dog and a gun and a rabbit. <laughs> and let's go to here, Rattler, here, 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 Rattler, here. Old old rattler from the barn here, yeah, rattler here. Yeah. Did you get that? Now, there's a 14 different verses of here, rattler here. Yeah. But the point we're really trying to bring out is no different than Grandpa Jones. Like the leaves up on the ground. I mean, he had a vision of his music and he worked with it till it become very important when you go to a college uh, like Janet I was showing you on the car there the parking mm -hmm. for going down there to the to the uh, Sinclair College up in Dayton Crystal wanted to learn how to play a banjo Red Law, an old timer, love him to death. Okay, he made his own banjo out of a cake pan and an apple tree limb. And his dad drove him all the way to Lexington, Kentucky, from Missouri, to buy him strings for that homemade. Banjo. Did you hear what I said? Mm -hmm. Okay. I got this on tape in there. It's it's hard to explain. Red Spearlock was crying when he was talking about this banjo. But he learned to play this banjo almost good as if it was the original. If you go back to my forefathers, they played their own music and their own music instruments they made. Are you listening? Okay. I got an uncle. He's dead now. But I went down. My mom told me he played a ba uh, fiddle. So I told mom, I'm going down to Uncle Chuck's and stay all night. So I went down there and the kids was all small and we was all playing around. And I looked at my Uncle Chuck and I said, Mom told me that you sold seeds in the neighborhood and you ended up with a cardboard fiddle. Uncle Chuck said, I can't imagine her telling you this. <laughs> he goes to his bed 
and he pulls out the lower part of the bed where another bed is, and there's a fiddle. The fiddle was in a box, cardboard box, cardboard fiddle. Are you listening? Mm -hmm. But the cardboard fiddle was hard cardboard. And he had taken care of this for years and years and years. And it was like brand new. Mm -hmm. But nobody touched his fiddle. And I looked at him and I said, Can you play that, Uncle Chuck? And he said, I can play that. You see that little piece of cement? That's about like his heart, mm -hmm. but about twice as big. <laughs> And my uncle said, what do you want to hear? And I said, oh, hear Rattler here, or just anything that you want to play on that fiddle. He said, uh, how about Sourwood Mountain? And I looked at him and I says, okay. Anything you want to play? And he goes, ding, ding, ding. And he keep tuning it up. And when he got it tuned up where he wanted it, yeah, I'm about ready. Tuned up a little more. So okay, Sourwood Mountain. He done a flat foot stomp that I ain't never in my life seen. And I, I even to this day, it, it just thrills me to know I had an uncle that could do that. My grandmother, my grandmother, her name was Jane Bailey, and she married my grandpa, which was a Collingsworth. Mm -hmm. She lived in Poor Valley, Virginia, the same as the, the Carter family, and she even knew the Carter family. She had four brothers, and two of them was Zach and Mac. The other one was uh, uh, Kyle and Cole Bailey. And Molly Bailey was Lester, was her uh, sister. So they cradled wheat and she would play an organ on Sunday at church. And the brothers got to the point where they would play a guitar and a banjo and a mandolin. And uh, they would cradle wheat from Virginia all the way in in the summertime and grandma would help the farmers wives cook meals but that's the way they lived back then they cradled wheat like you see these combines now nothing to it mm -hmm. but back years ago it was sweat and tears and when they come into doing what i'm talking about they played music for church and through the week they worked. They would go all the way to Renfro Valley, and there's where she learned to make that song, Come on down the mountain, everybody. Come on down the mountain, Coralie. It's raining on the mountain, but there's sunshine in the valley. Come on down and we'll have a jubilee. So everybody knew. They lived different than you and I do. Even the black people of life is exactly what I'm talking to you about. The white people was no different. And the mountain people was no different than the people that lived in the villages. Mm -hmm. So when you get into Hank Williams, he was Cajun. No, they told it was hillbilly. No, they told it was rockabilly. No, they didn't know what it was. But Hank William done something that nobody else could do, and that's in make people enjoy what he did. Are you listening? This is valuable. When he would come in on Saturday night, when he would come in on Saturday night to do the grand old opera, we're not talking about his son. We're talking about the great Hank William. He'd be drunker than a skunk. <laughs> and they would put many pearl which had nothing to do with him. And she was a religious individual. Here's Hank Williams, tight, drunk as a skunk, and she would take and get him coffee and drive him around town all day Saturday to sober him up. 
to play at the Grand Old Opry. Are you listening? Mm -hmm. This is the most stable part of music. Everybody goes through this. There is so much jealousy within music that Buddy Holly and a lot of good people died because somebody tampered with their airplane. Mm -hmm. I want to say a lot, but I can't say that. People are jealous of the great Johnny Cash. There's people jealous of Garth Brooks. Uh, I'm trying to explain music, but I'm not trying to hold it libel. Because I know nothing about music. When I think I can sing, I'm singing off key, I guarantee you. But the point is, I enjoy what I hear or what I feel. Rhythmatic, back to the heartbeat, and what we really are, all of it. And it takes you, if you can do it, and you've got the hearing ability and the knowledge to do it, to teach others that want to teach. When Crystal does the turnover, she calls it, it's the most important part of a banjo. And it's the fifth string that's always out of tune. <laughs> if you watch anybody that plays a banjo, the first thing they'll do is, yeah, and they'll beat that fifth string. When they get that fifth string in there, they can check the rest of the strings. When they play off beat and want it to go off beat like white lightning, the first thing they do is use old fifth string. Are you listening? Mm -hmm. That's what I know about banjo music. There's a hell of a lot more to it <laughs> than that. But what we're really trying to bring out to you is your education, even to yourself, is a valuable asset to other people. Mm. And instead of starting at a school level, you could go to a high school, but I suggest college. I suggest that if you, well, you're involved with the part that needs to be taught. So that's, if they, you start out, Let's say you're doing your style. No two people play a guitar the same. Right. Even though they might sound the same. So the, the guy that you teach might end up being the guy that plays with, who knows? Can you imagine, let me think a little bit, Roy Clark and him playing with a high orchestras that they had in Russia and him from America and a dumbass out of Tennessee. <laughs> Did you get that part? But Roy Clark could play any instrument with his toes. <laughs> I watched him personally. In his band I was with him blah blah and watched him play and Roy Clark is something to, to recognize in a guitar. Uh, uh, okay, Mother Maybell's son, uh, Chet Atkins, the king of, of music. Mm -hmm. there, there's no doubt that the Carter family started long time ago. Let me give you one of Carter family's songs, just a little bit of it. It's a the one woman was a, si a sister to June Carter, was Anita Carter. And John Cash loved her to death. He wrote a letter about her on the back of his album about how great a religious individual she was, so on and so on, and what kind of a sister-in-law she was. We're talking about Crystal uh, uh, Anita Carter, she sings this song. 
The horse test jumper start his overhauls. He caught that train, they called it Cannonball. From Buffalo to Washington. Mother Maybell played the auto harp and was famous for that auto harp. Even though her voice was very valuable, June was always the flip. She was never a singer, even with Johnny Cash. Uh, I'm going to, what do they say? Uh, I'm going to Jackson. Look at Jackson down. It was rhythm that she just automatically got. But she did do things for Johnny Cash that Johnny Cash couldn't do himself. And Mother Maybell and A.P. Carter. I got A.P. Carter on a tape. We're talking about a two-hour tape. I got him planting tobacco. I got him sucking tobacco. I got him using his mules out in the field to plow the tobacco. I got him drunk as a skunk. <laughs> and I got him with a big five gallon, 55 gallon drum full of wood and a tying tobacco in the barn. I got the A.P. Carter that I know. And he was original. He was an original. And he had an old car, he bought a brand new car. You tell how much money he made with the music that he, he wasn't no slouch. But his farming was more important. Here's Johnny Cash, teenage queen. Dream on, dream on, teenage queen. Soon you'll be on the movie screen. Then one day a talent scout came to town to take her out. Hollywood could offer more, so she left the boy next door, A.P. Carter. <laughs> and she went and became famous, and was famous as a movie star. When she came back, she tried to get back in with A.P. And if you want to hear more, go down to Poor Valley at the candy store, back in the holler. There's a candy store, and Johnny Cash and June's the one seen to it they had it, okay? But that's what the story's all about. If you want to hear more, you can hear it all. At the candy that's store. A, that's a love story of Johnny Cash or Mother Maybell. When we get back to Hilo Brown, you are, you are the important product of what I'm talking about. If you play music, you don't have to run the roads or the liquor stores. If you get with, listen cautiously, Kmart, Walmart, Myers, a little general store, thrift stores, Renfro Valley, you can go down to uh, to uh, Corbin, Kentucky, flea market. You get in there, sell your products. Your talent, like Hilo Brown, played a little music here and played a little music there, but his brain would not let him travel because from a bottle to a needle, from a needle to a thread. It says the great people of the grand old opera. And that right there makes it pop out for people to listen. He says, these people travel and they're known all around and they're making money from every town. But he says, from a bottle to a needle, and him and Ed would drink, okay? He knew what he was talking about, to a needle. From a needle to a grave. The same as the guy was told Jim, uh, uh, 
Well, he made dog and gun. <laughs> you know, Bradley Kincaid, from Bradley Kincaid's time to my grandpa and my grandma, and the organ that my mom had, and they still got it in a church that my grandma owned. my two great uncles to me is a life history nothing else but to go to Renfro Valley and stand where they open the doors to cook to dry the tobacco out and they run the cattle out and clean the hay up and put new hay down cow shit and so on and they're in there dancing, and you can't get in because there's so many in there dancing. And it's from a bottle to a needle, from a needle to a grave. You're talking about people like Jim, Jim. You know who I'm talking about. <laughs> he, he said, I'm not my dad. So I, I don't know nothing about what you're talking about. I looked at him and I said, let me tell you a story about Grandpa Jones that he told me sitting beside him at a campsite in Kentucky at North Lake. He's supposed to be fishing. But he said, all I do is sit here and enjoy the fire. <laughs> and he had this guy come up and get me because we were square dancers. And we went down and just sat and talked to him. And here's what he said to me. He said, when I was a kid in Missouri, he said, my dad was a bootlegger. Okay. A bootlegger is big still yet in Tennessee, Kentucky, Alabama, Georgia, Mississippi. Like, you want to keep going? <laughs> We're telling you something. A bootlegger. Let me give you a little song about bootlegging. A 12-cylinder Lincoln. You ever see one of them? Mm -mm. Well, my brother owned one, and it's a coupe. And it was a like a 40, uh, I don't know, I can't remember. But anyway, it was a 41 Lincoln Zephyr, 12 cylinders. Are you listening? Mm -hmm. And this is the words they said in the song. It says, Thunder Mountain, Thunder Road, 12-cylinder Lincoln Zephyr. She would go at 140 miles an hour across Cumberland Mountain. Don't you know 40 gallons of homebrew? Good old mountain, good old mountain dew. says, that Lincoln Zephyr, how she would roll into Hardin County, and don't you know, said everybody would be happy, and so and she'd go into Renfro Valley, Tennessee. They'd put on a bluegrass show for me, back to Pineville, across that mountain. She would go at 140 miles an hour, at Lincoln Zephyr it would go thunder, thunder road, thunder white lightning was low, thunder, thunder, thunder road. Gives you an idea of what I'm saying. About. <laughs> that was pretty good. <laughs> so the point we're trying to bring out, you're no different today. You, we have, we have in our and our people that travel. This boy at five years old, Noel Bolin, Noel Bolin, taught his grandson how to play a mandolin, a fiddle, a banjo, and a guitar. At five years old, he was playing a model. He traveled. He got homesick and come home. Hello, Brown. 
Remember I talked to you about our little brown? Mm -hmm. He got homesick. He called Grandma. And his wife, his mom and dad, and everybody, you know, behind him 100%. He's getting up now about 18 years old, but it, we're talking about from five. It's this great big mama. I mean, we're talking about a, a bus on the road. And uh, the other people was the band. He was just, when they'd tell him to get up, he'd play whatever they told him to play. Are you listening? Mm -hmm. So he young enough to where he got homesick. Called Grandma, I don't like this kind of life. Blah, 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 and what I've been trying to talk to you about. When he come home, he plays local. Uh, there's a good chance I could get you some time to go watch him play. Mm -hmm. But at five years old, I mean, he didn't argue with you. He'd pick up that big heavy banjo and make her, yeah. He likes Ralph Stanley style, mountain, mountain style banjo playing. But uh, uh, when you really get down to these people, they're all just like you. If for, let's say a year, man, you'd enjoy yourself out there on the road with that big bus and whatnot. And before you know it, it turned you into, you're no longer the person you was. Uh, look at people like Elvis Presley, Ricky Nelson, you know, I go way back. One of my favorite musical bunch in the 50s was uh, Dwayne Eddy and the Rebel Rousers. And them boys, when they would come in there, yakety yak on that, I mean, they made you stand up. Back then we had the Witch Doctor, the song Witch Doctor, and then the, well, he came down to the earth and he lit on the ground, people purple eater or whatever it was. Uh, you go back, you'll see it. They, they still sell the music. But the point we're trying to bring out to you is the 50s was a change of my life for music. And I started realizing that there's more to music than a fiddle or a guitar or a banjo. And you can't let other people advise you. That don't work. You are what you are, and you're going to do what you want to do. Even though somebody might change your standard. Once you start drinking, and once you start shooting your needle, uh, and whatever. Today, it, it's a world that, that you can't, you can't come down the mountain. Mm. I went down to Renfro Valley and we was gonna go to the barn where they have the, uh, what is that, WRVK, Renfro Valley, Kentucky, barn dance. And uh, they get up, big old uh, uh, five gallon, keep the place heated up, barn and it's on Route 25 East. You can go down there any time and listen to them on Friday night and Saturday night. But the point is, they still got Renfro Valley in town that they've rebuilt the new Coliseum and whatnot. Uh, uh, my wife and daughter's got uh, trophies in there of, of uh, clogging and square dancing trophies from Renfro Valley. We're well known. They're right now, at the daughter and the mother is teaching Renf uh, down in uh, Fairborn. Fairborn. They're, they're down there teaching with the Five Point Cloggers uh, uh, Western Square Dance Clogging. Now, when you get out there and you shake and you rhythmatically Anybody can do that. But when you become an educated system in how to make your feet where, when, what, and so on, 
that's where it really counts is the educating part of it. It's no different than music. You want anybody, like I told you, everybody's rhythmatically. Everybody can get out on the dance floor and shimmy and shake. And babe, some of them can put out. <laughs> I mean, we're not talking about just one type, but there's a thousand different types. So we stick straightly to Western square dance. And our clogging within the Western square dance, we're, we're talking about, uh, I may be in Toledo next week. I might be in Cincinnati the next week. I could be in uh, uh, Nova Scotia. I'm serious. Uh, we've been all over. I mean, we stayed five nights. Imagine this. Open your mind up real close. Alan Jackson has never hit his peak. We danced five days at the Grand Old Opry Motel. Mm. They bring people over here, dignitaries, and it cost $1,600 a night mm. to stay one night at the Grand Old Opry Motel. Did you hear what I just said? And you can check me out, because I know what I'm saying. We stayed five days, and we was in uh, competition, and we was with the Shooting Stars, Five Point Cloggers, and the Wildwood Cloggers. And they had the whole national, which is uh, all states, so when you get into the international, you're talking about going into Canada. I've been there, and we danced at the uh, Jellystone National Park. But when you get into music, I'm leading you up to everything I'm saying. I've been here at 16 years old. I've been dancing all my life, and I don't hear. I had to learn to watch you and know what he was saying through you when you was in my square. Are you listening? To do that, you better be good. You better be ready to grab or swing and blah. So it's the same thing with music. No two people play music the same. They're not supposed to. But all of them coordinate. The coordination of music, here's one that's going to really shock you. I'm going to really get to the heart of it. The great Patty Loveless. Okay. Okay. The great Patty Loveless was Dolly Parton's backup. Mm. Did you hear what I said? Dolly Parton started in Kaz Walker's in Knoxville, Tennessee, and I was there many times when she would sing at Kaz Walker's grocery store. And they'd just be on the floor and would play the music. Okay, so and so. We're, we're talking about, what would I call her a few minutes ago? Uh, uh, flip. Huh? Flip. No, uh, Dolly, Dolly's back up. Uh, I'm losing it, so hang in there. Uh, she, she played with Vince Gill. Mm -hmm. Who was her his backup singer? Huh? Backup singer? Yeah, the backup singer was uh, Patty Loveless. Listen cautiously. Scratch the name, but love it to hell on back when you hear her on the music. Patty Loveless. She played with Vince Gill and uh, the song that he went high, higher, higher on that mountain. She was the backup that went higher for Vince Gill. Are you listening to me? Patty Loveless was Dolly Parton's backup. 50 cents out of the $50 that Dolly would get. 
Are you listening? Mm -hmm. On the road, Porter Wagner told a story, not me, on television one night about they was going to back to Tennessee and they had him in a seat asleep and Dolly invited him in to lay with him and her and Patty. They was trying to catch up on this music and before he noted, it, he laid down and he slept all night with Patty Loveless and Dolly Parton in the bed on the bus. Are you listening? <laughs> so, getting back to Patty Loveless. We talked about Ralph Stanley and his 24 million on that movie uh, of being uh, Constant Sorrow. In that song, he looked at Patty Loveless. She was there that night in celebration of Constant Sorrow for Carter and Ralph Stanley, his brothers, that Carter's dead. So Ralph needed someone to sing Carter's part, and he asked Patty Loveless to sing it. Okay? And he said, I tell you what, when we get off of this show, and we're talking about he was on television, so the rest of the was wood floor. And uh, we're talking about a shack up on the mountain. And uh, it was a cold winter's night, and we was waiting on these, this uh, doe, we're talking about a goat, to have twins. Luckily, she had twins. And uh, Uncle Chuck was going out to the barn to check on her, and then he'd come back and stay by the fire there and whatnot. I, I told him, I said, I'd like to hear him say that. He said, well, I ain't doing anything. He said, that'd be a good time for me to do. Mm -hmm. And he said, I haven't played this in so long, Doc. He said, I can't even imagine whether I know the notes or not. So when he got through, uh, my heart still rings for him, if you know what I mean. And uh, I had other people that I'm involved with. Uh, uh, Johnny Messer is a guy. <laughs> it's down where you might see him. He got kicked out of metallic casket. They shut it down. They down no choice but to kick him out. And he's on welfare. And I'm listening to him play a mandolin. And he makes he makes uh, Marty Stewart look look bad. You know what I mean? Marty Stewart is probably the top dog when it comes to playing a mandolin or a, a guitar or a black. So I'm listening to him, boy. He's up there, and I got to know him real well. I mean, probably three or four years, and I got to know him real well. Talked to him and so on, so on. He knowed my brother. He said, I remember you. And I said, remember me? He said, yeah. He said, you remember your Aunt Bessie? And I said, Aunt Bessie? Yeah, I her. Aunt Bessie lived right out the hill from me. He said, do you remember that little boy that was there for about a year? He said, I used to play with you out there on the hillside. And I looked at him and I said, Johnny. I remember Aunt Bessie had a little boy named Johnny, but she couldn't have any kids. He said, well, the bad part, you don't know about probably. I said, what was that? He said, Hooper stole me. Mm. And I looked at him and I said, you're kidding me, Johnny. I said, what happened? He said, the feed mill in Harborville, you go through the middle, over the mountain, you go through Middlesbrough and into Barberville, and then you go into Pineville. So Barberville is just a little town off 75, or off the old 25 West, what it's off of. And they had a mill there that, you know, they had feed for the cows and horses and stuff. And uh, they were, they were uh, out there loading his truck up with his feed to bring into the mountains there. And 
He said, I clam into the cab of his truck. He said, we didn't have a truck. Everything back when I lived in Tennessee it was all horses and sleds and wagons. You follow me? We didn't have no automobile. So. Get that away. But anyway, that. That, uh, getting back to Johnny, he said, Cooper got in the car, and he said, are you, are you going with me? And he said, I don't, yeah. He said, I'm going to take a ride in that new truck. And Hooper just got out of service. And uh, in fact, he was shell-shocked. And uh, it, it was comical. But I would, I remember Johnny, you know, as a little kid, I played with him, so, and so. so he's talking to me, he said, what happened was, he said, he took me home and kept me six months. Mm. And he said, my mom finally put a missing report in on her. Back then, they didn't do things like they do now. But now, they got them like this. Anyway, I remember police coming up there, and I, that's all I can remember was the police come up there, and a little boy disappeared. Ain't best couldn't have any kids, so Hooper brought him home, and he just actually stole it. Mm. <laughs> so the police, they they realized the circumstances, and the Tennessee people are like this. I mean, the, the whole mountains know one another and the police knowed Hooper and they let him off and the, the woman that knowed him in Barberville run the feed mill. Can you mm. imagine what I just said to you? But this Six goes months. On. Well this goes on all the time in our country. Yeah. We don't realize how uh, I grew up a little barefoot boy in hell they could have cared less I was 15 miles away every day I'd take off you know, I was, I was different. Uh, in Tennessee, Ohio is different. There's two different worlds I will live in. Uh, we didn't have nothing. So uh, I eat I uh, possum grapes, wild grapes. I eat uh, uh, dandelions. My mom would take dandelions, the flower, dunk them down in cornbread and put them in because us being kids man we just loved it <laughs> and we got we got uh, vitamins and stuff from that uh, flower the the dandelion that, that is good for you I didn't know that until I grew up I, I tell doctors this when I'm with my doctor a lot of times I tell I eat a buckeye buckeye poison Everybody knows that. It's about the it. first thing you're taught by mom and dad is don't eat a buckeye. So I eat a buckeye and my brother's older one. He says, hey, mom, he eat a buckeye. And we'd walk down from the mountain, believe this or not. It was already in my stomach. So mom says, you eat a buckeye? And she goes in and a big old fag in there. When we get off of this show, I'm writing you one million dollars for you backing me up on this song. Did you hear me? He was paid 24 million, and he'd eat up baloney all of his life. But listen to this song. She backed him up. On. She says, this is Patty Loveless and Ralph Stanley singing. So think about two of them that's involved and she's backing him up. He says, Pretty Polly, Pretty Polly, come and go with me. Pretty Polly, Pretty Polly, come and go with me. I'll take you to the mountains and the hills of Tennessee. Are you listening to old Ralph? And when he got back in there, he said, uh, They went a little piece further to the woods they did go. So they went a little piece further into the woods they did go. Said, uh, 
Sweet William, sweet William, Patty Loveless. Sweet William, sweet William. Turn, I know I'm afraid of your way. The way that you are leading, it's leading me astray. Pretty Polly, pretty Polly, you're thinking just right. Pretty Polly, pretty Polly, you're thinking just right. I did six long hours on your grave of last night. Mm. Sweet William, sweet William, they went a little piece further into the woods they did go. A newly made spade and a grave lying by. Sweet William, sweet William. Or, no, sir. Uh, he, he stabbed her with it and she opened up her bosom as white as it snow. He stabbed her with a knife and her blood it did overflow. Sweet William, sweet William, turn loose of my hand. Now imagine Patty up there. Sweet William, sweet William, turn loose of my hand. Look at my life's blood flowing around there where you stand. So come in a little more, he says. He threw some dirt on her, returning to go home. He threw some dirt on her, returning to go home. Leaving nothing there but the birdies to moan. He went to the jailhouse, and what did he say? I killed Pretty Polly, and I'm trying to get away. Mm. That's the whole song. Mm. I'm a way off key, but the you, you gave me chills. Yeah, it, it, well, it's no different than the one about. Mm. Well, you you've heard the one about. Uh, let's give you a good one. Uh, down by the bank, where the water flows. Down by the bank of the mighty Ohio. Said I had a girl, and I loved her so. I asked her to marry me, and she said no. Said I stabbed her with a bloody knife. I took her by the yellow hair. And I threw her around and around. I threw her in the water deep. There with the fishes she could sleep. Down by the bank where the water flows. Down by the bank of the mighty Ohio. Let me say something. The great Miami Indian Lake coming out of Lake Erie, comes into Indian Lake. And the Great Miami comes right down by us into Dayton, into Cincinnati, and into the Mississippi. Down by the banks where the water flows, down by the banks of the mighty Ohio. I water skied in the Ohio River, and it's something to think about. Mm. My brother played all kinds of instruments. He took back after grandma and I got every kind of instrument you could think of. My life was not music, but I love music. And I think of people that play music no matter what, or how they sang. I went to church, and I'm a very religious individual. I can turn bitter, I guess, but I try to stay religious as much as I can, especially at my age. <laughs> but uh, people like uh, uh, Another name that's real easy for me, but I can't think of the guy that that uh, takes care of Xenia radio station down there. Uh, 
He plays music here at the Wittenberg. He plays music all around. He's a personal friend of mine. And he is Jimmy Martin, sisters, is his wife. Are you listening? Mm -hmm. His name is Wiggins. Last name is Wiggins. Jimmy Martin said the best music that I ever heard. Said the best music I've ever heard is back behind the stage or out in the cornfield and us practicing. He said that's the when you hear people like they really are. And he said the best you he said they turn on and you can't get them to turn off. <laughs> he said it's something to think of. Uh, I think of Rumpo Valley every time I think of music, not the grand old opera. So I may make you sound funny, but in Renfro Valley, there's 1,500 people, and we're keeping it small. We went to a golf club up here in Columbus. I know the name of it, can't think of it. They had square dancing, they had clogging, western, and they had uh, one of one of uh, George Jones's buddies up there. I can't think of his name now. But anyway, he had 15,000 people up there. Can you imagine that? I mean, it was unbelievable. He's still, he's still one of their hopping hillbillies or whatever you want. <laughs> but, but the point I'm trying to bring out to you is the more people you got, the more disaster it becomes to the real good music uh, or talent like my Uncle Chuck. <laughs> I, I could not believe him. He got up on the hearth and got on Bucket of Lord, she takes the lid off, takes her hand like that, into my mouth it went and held it. You swallow that, you swallow it. I mean swallow And when I swallowed it, Baby, everything just in a few minutes. Came I mean, that, <laughs> when I tell the doctor this, he said, I've heard everything about midwives. But he said, that one is something very important to remember as a doctor. Mm. He said, believe it or not, he said, we would try to use medicine. And the kid died. Snake bites. There's some snakes you better be afraid of. There's some snakes that you can just play with them like they're. I was afraid of snakes, period. I'd be swimming here and there'd be snakes right out there playing around too. He's over here trying to beat me up. Hold on a second.